just to remind everyone in the room what Pamela just said, she hasn't had a speaking engagement in over a year, and the first ones to invite her to a speaking engagement were the gays who trumped. because this man needs no introduction whatsoever. Wow. The world's wow. most dangerous faggot.
only system that works. Nothing has been devised. USA. And if the left wants to turn New York into Raqqa, it's got a fight on its hands because they're going to have to go up against the gays first. Now the left thinks that it owns academia, the left thinks it owns the media, the left thinks it owns all of these things. So it's got a really nasty shock coming. Because I'm not the only person who is dedicated to the, to the destruction of liberal media in this country. Yeah. I am not the only person who recognizes that after a few decades of good work, these people have now thrown us under the bus. Yep. I'm not the only one who recognizes that a Republican candidate, that Donald Trump, is the most pro-gay candidate in American electoral history. Yeah. Yeah. Go Trump! Brit with slightly over bleached hair. Fucked out dress sense. We love you, Mallow. Woo! I have come here to speak to you. I've come here to give you a warning from Europe. In the countries I come from, the countries that Get Wilder comes from, the countries that many of the speakers that you'll hear elsewhere have come from from Europe, we have seen what the results are of letting Western culture, that culture that protects us, that holds us precious, that keeps us safe. We have seen what the consequences of letting it go can be. Which is why... <laughs> I know, I've got police in the back. Yes, if you're in the back talking, go fuck yourselves, go out. Yeah. of those odious decisions are, which is why next week I'm going to Sweden. Yeah! And in Sweden, which has the um, humiliating distinction of being the rape capital of Europe, thanks of course to Islamic immigration, what else? Where Islamic immigration isn't just hurting gays, as it is in Orlando, but it's hurting women more than anything else. And I will be leading a gay pride march through the Muslim ghetto in Stockholm. Yeah. I'll be doing this because nobody else will. I'll be doing this because the liberal media has decided that other people rank higher than we do in their oppression pyramid. Bullshit! We tables of victimhood. Well, you know what, growing up gay wasn't that fucking bad, let's be honest. <laughs> But I still don't see the reason why the left-wing press mollycoddles and panders to an ideology that wants me dead. I don't understand why brain-dead celebrities tweet out messages of hope and love and all this like precious and basic. It's fantastic. They're this cut. isn't going to save you when somebody has an AK-47 points back. What will save you is having your own. Twitter account and they will come for you to make no mistake about it. Do not be fooled. You are all next. 
If you're the wrong group with the wrong beliefs, the left will come for you, and the left includes, social, uh, includes Silicon Valley. What gay people have to understand, and I'll leave you with this because I don't want to get back to drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Gay people bear some responsibility. It was us. It was me. It was this group who gave the left their power. The gay fashion designers, inventors, artists, politicians, going back further in history, warlords. We're on average smarter than uh, straight people, so we're open. <laughs> All the categories were natural. Sorry about it. Uh, <laughs> But we sort of did this. We gave the left the power that they had. We enabled them. We colonized Hollywood and the media. All of the other places they, they wanted us to be and they wanted us to, to spread these, um, what have become insane, hateful social justice maxims. But what we have given, we can take away. And it's time for us to take it away. So uh, the only thing that Breitbart's ever cut from column of mine um, was a joke. I said, um, the Daily Beast says that whites only on your grinder profile is racist. Well, my grinder profile says blacks only. Is that racist? <laughs> Hell no. Obviously, I wouldn't write blacks only because I don't want to offend potential mates. So I'll just write, don't contact me if you're under seven inches or you know who your dad is. <laughs> Tom Wood Show, episode 697. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here, the Tom Woods Show. Hi everybody, Tom Woods here. I am committed to getting five episodes of the show out this week. We're back to normal, more or less. I mean in terms of the schedule, not in terms of me. I'm not in any way back to normal. I'm, I've got boxes everywhere. I've got the Mises University program coming up next week. I've, I've just got so much going on. But if I don't get myself back on a schedule, I'm going to go crazy. So I'm releasing this episode, even though it's a little bit late. One way or another, the five episodes are coming out. You know, maybe one of them bleeds over into the weekend. I don't know what may have to happen, but the episodes, doggone it, they are coming out this week. Now, this particular one, you know, this on Monday, I had two people lined up to interview, and they both, I had to cancel them both because of complications relating to our move. And then uh, yesterday, I couldn't find my mobile hotspot, which I'm using for Internet, until I get Internet uh, hooked up here at the house tomorrow. So it's, so I couldn't find that, so I couldn't do that interview. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So I have several people i got to reschedule with. Totally crazy. Not your problem. My problem. But in the meantime, this is something I've been wanting to do an episode about anyway. Bob Murphy, who you know is my co-host on the Contra Krugman podcast over at ContraKrugman.com. Bob, other than on the episode where he debated Vox Day, has, I think, either been on the show only once or maybe even not at all since we started Contra Krugman. 
and I got to get that guy back on the show uh, here and there. We, I got to somehow persuade him to come back on. He's finishing up a course for uh, Liberty Classroom on the history of economic thought uh, over at libertyclassroom.com. So that's a good thing. I don't want to bother him while he's doing that. But anyway, Bob had an article not long ago on the subject of the profit and loss system. And it's important because I think this is one of these areas in which people are led to believe that we advocate something that is wicked, evil, antisocial in a fundamental way, and yet the opposite is true. So that when we talk about profits and the, the value of profits and the importance of profit, we say these words and yet they enter people's ears as greed, 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 wicked, wicked, wicked. And uh, I want to explain something about profit. If we were to say, we don't want a society that's based on profit, you get this a lot from people on the left, on the socialist left. We can't have a society that's based on profit. We can't have an economy that's based on profit. Well, my glib response to that is always, so you'd rather have an economy based on losses? All right, all right. I mean, I know I guess I'm being somewhat playful when I say that, but it's so important to understand the value, the importance, and, and the function of profit. And when you do understand it, I think an honest person would say, I think my previous objections were silly, they were misinformed, they were based on my having been in a position of ignorance at that time, because now I sort of get it, that there is something important about profit. As a matter of fact, let's stop for a minute and think about the big picture. What does it mean in the grand scheme of things for a business firm to earn a profit? or by contrast to suffer a loss. What does that actually mean? Well when a business firm earns a profit it means it has added value for consumers. It has taken a combination of resources so let's say uh, land, uh, labor resources, intermediate goods of various kinds, raw materials and it's transformed and combined them in such a way that people value that finished product more than they value the raw inputs. And so they've added value to these inputs. And the fact that they earn this profit is a validation by society of their decision to take these resources and combine and transform them in this way to produce that product. So that's a good thing. There's nothing bad about that. That's a good thing. We want business firms to do this. And when they earn these profits, they are in effect showing that the inputs that go into making these products had previously been undervalued. There was a profit opportunity there to combine these resources in such a way that they can earn over and above what they spent on the inputs factoring in the the uh, the time factor that we that uh, we refer to as the interest rate. But the point is the business firm has taken resources and done something with them that meets with the approval of many consumers, that satisfies consumer preferences. So there's nothing about that that's bad. There's nothing about that that we should lament or be angry about or there's certainly no reason to be talking about greed which has nothing whatsoever to do with this process. In fact, I like the way Bob puts it. He says, to bemoan a capitalist earning high profits is like complaining about a surgeon saving too many lives. If we think of the contrary case where the business firm suffers a loss, what does that mean? It means that the firm wants to produce some good, but pretty much, if not everybody in society, then a whole lot of people in society think that firm is making a bad decision, that, it would, that society would rather see those inputs used in the production of other goods and they think that the diversion of those inputs into the production of this particular good is a waste. It's a waste of the resources involved. And so the loss is society's way of saying, are you really sure that this is the way you want to combine these resources? Because a lot of us think these resources would be better allocated in other ways. So this is a way for there to be, you know, people talk a lot about democracy, but 
This is the way the will of the people, if I may put it that way, gets transmitted up through the production structure that they that the, the business firm at the retail level realizes that there just are not adequate sales for this particular product and they can't earn a, a profit on it or they certainly can't earn a profit producing it in this particular way. So they have to go back to the drawing board, figure out if there's some other production process that might make it more profitable for them, or if there's some other related kind of product they could make, if there's a completely different kind of product they could make. There are a lot of kinds of questions that they have to ask themselves and changes they need to make to what they've been up to. So this is what profit and loss really amount to, and you can see that both of these, both things, profit and loss, serve a salutary purpose of taking the resources of society and steering them into production processes that conform most consistently to consumer preferences. Because we do have to reckon, even though we live in a world uh, in which there is terrific abundance in many ways, nevertheless it is still fundamentally a world of scarcity. We can't have everything we want. We can't enjoy all the possible goods that we might want to have. Not every one of us can have every single good he might want to have. So there are trade-offs involved in everything. What that means is that even if, even if something that a business firm is producing might seem to, you know, let's say a guy from Mars just looking at the, the, the looking at planet Earth dispassionately may say, well, that seems like a meritorious thing that that business firm is doing, producing that particular good. The question isn't that in some abstract sense is the business firm producing something that's useful and worthwhile. The question is, is this particular good that the firm is producing worth producing when we set it against what might have been produced in its place? We always have to think in terms of foregone opportunities, precisely because we can't have everything. Now, going back to, I'm going to link to, of course, uh, Bob's article, and there, there are a couple of articles on this that he's done, so I'll try and remember to link to those at tomwoods.com slash 697. Bob says that, and of course, I think we all, we all know this, the entire economic plan, if we might put it that way, of society is far too complex to entrust to any one group. So this is why it's a good thing to have a system that disperses control over resources among billions of authorities. But at the same time, there needs to be some coordination when you have billions of people and each one is making decisions about production and and how to allocate his own labor services and you know what to produce and what to do and how to fit himself in to the global division of labor there's going to be some kind of coordinating mechanism and it's the Ludwig von Mises answer that private property and money prices are those coordinating mechanisms and that the, the money prices emerge through the spontaneous process of buying and selling by individuals. That process yields you prices. That's where prices come from. They're not dictated by, or at least they don't have to be dictated by any political authority, and when they are, they, that always causes chaos. They emerge spontaneously from the normal uh, buying and selling process of a vast majority of individuals, of, of, of a, a great bulk of individuals, and the result is a system that allows entrepreneurs to figure out what it seems like is the best thing to produce. That when Entrepreneurs can't be infallible, but they can take a look at the array of existing prices, in, uh, prices of outputs, prices of inputs, and use that as data to reckon, to figure out what makes sense, what will be likely to earn them a profit uh, for them to produce. The profit and loss system also helps to keep entrepreneurs from making ridiculous, ludicrous decisions that would be harmful and wasteful. Bob gives the example of, let's say, people who are building apartment buildings, and they want to, let's say, paint the walls uh, 
or let's say they're going to coat the interiors of these apartments with solid gold. Now, surely there would be some people who would love to have an apartment coated in solid gold, but would there be enough of those people to make that kind of decision economically sensible? Probably not, which is why you don't see apartments that are coated in solid gold. That's because gold is simply too expensive for the price is just too high for it to make sense as a, a wall coating in an apartment. But th the mere fact that gold's price is high does not mean that gold, therefore, is too expensive to be used in any production process whatsoever. We know that gold jewelry can be highly profitable. And that's because people who are in the market for jewelry are indeed prepared to pay for gold. And they're indeed they're prepared to pay enough of a spread between what they would pay for a silver necklace as opposed to a gold necklace. They're willing to pay enough extra for the gold necklace that it is very much worthwhile for the jeweler to uh, produce or sell gold necklaces. And in fact, the very fact that gold is expensive is an indication that, it, that it's, it's, it's so expensive as to be prohibitive as a coating material for apartment walls. The reason it's so expensive is precisely that other entrepreneurs are bidding so heavily for it in the production of other things. And so pro the profit and loss test makes sure that gold is used only in the production of things that make sense, that people actually want uh, gold to be used in. People are willing to pay, uh, people are willing to part with their own resources to, uh, to acquire, and they're not willing to part with their resources for solid gold-coated apartment walls. So that, that would be a waste of gold, and the profit and loss system, in effect, steers entrepreneurs away from uh, uh, economically destructive decisions like that and makes sure that the resources are employed in ways that are socially beneficial and conform to people's preferences. Now, apparently, not long ago in Venezuela, there was some kind of law imposed that was intended to limit profits. Again, the, 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 there's no reason you'd want to limit profits. Uh, as we've seen, profit is an entirely benign thing. There's nothing about it that you would want to limit. But they want to limit profits to cut, uh, what, what it would be legitimate for a business firm to earn to cost plus 30 percent. And that would be, they thought, fair. So, all right, well again, Profit is not something you'd want to punish because profit means that you or your, your firm anticipated consumer demand better than anybody else. And so that's precisely people who are good at anticipating consumer demand, they should be rewarded with re more resources because they're the best at figuring out what people want and providing it to them at uh, a price that people are happy to pay. So those are precisely the people who should have command over resources. That's a good thing. Now think, though, Think about the incentive that's produced if we were to say everybody is allowed to earn or earn back the cost of production plus 30 percent. Let's say that, that was there's some kind of limit like that. Then what you would get, and here's uh, Bob's example. Think about local governments that monopolize uh, electricity production, for example. And then they use cost plus pricing. They say that in their investors can earn a, a so-called fair rate of return through cost plus pricing. So they can get their cost back plus a little extra. The problem with that, as Bob explains, is that it views costs of production as a given. So that is to say there would be obviously far, far less incentive to want to look around and figure out ways to cut costs to figure out uh, how you can deliver megawatt hours more cheaply. Because if you know, as a, if you're a firm you, that you, you know you, you're allowed to, you know, you can charge your cost plus a margin for profit, well then what's the real overwhelming urge to cut those costs? You're, you're, you know, you're, you're, gonna get, you're gonna get your profit anyway. So this is not a helpful way to, uh, to operate, instead just Forget this cost plus approach, just let profit and loss operate freely in the market.
and the result is the best uh, best result we can have. It doesn't mean it's it's a perfect result, but it's the best result we can we can hope for in this world. Now, here's an interesting insight that Bob had back in 2010 after the uh, there was a terrible earthquake in Haiti, and Bob actually went to Haiti. I, I, not not a lot of people know this. He has written about it, but Bob actually went to Haiti for a week to help out and try and uh, contribute to disaster relief using his own physical labor. And he talks about it in, in this article, and he, he, he thinks in terms of how the people, himself included, in Haiti might have helped more efficiently. He says that basically he, being the professional economist in his group, was the only one thinking in the following way. Uh, everybody was just thinking, well, you know, we've all got to go out there and contribute. And we don't want people slacking off by having everybody sign up for the cushy jobs, like, like uh, preparing the poles for, for building tents and, and things like that, you know, s assembling these poles. Uh, instead, you know, we, we want people to, you know, to get out there and, and, and take a sledgehammer and break apart concrete blocks. And Bob says, well, to be a tough guy, I volunteered for rubble crew more than necessary, but I probably would have contributed more if I had focused on pole assembly, because I was pretty good at that. But the decisions as to who was to do what weren't based on any economic considerations or efficiency considerations or how can we produce the most help for these people. It was all bureaucratic and arbitrary and based certainly on good intentions, but not on the idea that, well, we've got limited manpower here. Let's try and see how it can be best allocated to produce the, the best result for everybody. Again, he says, nobody but me was thinking like this. None of the team leaders had to provide an account of the resources, including the labor of the volunteers, used during a particular day, and compare that to the amount of help, however quantified, their team had provided to the Haitians. In other words, there was no way for the team leaders to apply a cost-benefit test to their respective operations. And then Bob compares this to his job when he worked in the dairy uh, section of a uh, grocery store when he was much younger. He said that we were thinking always in terms of profit, and in terms of profit simply meant providing what consumers wanted. We had to know, should we, should we be selling chocolate milk? Uh, and how much of the white milk should we have available? How much, uh, you know, whole milk? How much 2% milk? How, mu how much skim milk? What should the individual workers be doing? All these things had to be measured against the standard, you know, held up to the standard of, of profit and loss to make sure that everybody's doing that job that adds the most value for the consumer. So there's nothing to be upset about with profit. And in fact, of course, when a firm begins to make uh, significant profits or there's a whole industry that's making significant profits, what winds up happening, of course, is this attracts entrance into that industry because people want a piece of the, of the action. And so there's now more production taking place in that industry, and therefore the profit there falls because there's now there, there's more production going on. The profit, in effect, is being spread around more. We may think of it that way. And so that pushes profits down, whereas losses lead to firms exiting an industry, and then there are fewer firms remaining, and there's less production, and the losses begin to cease. And so this is how production is regulated by profit. It's regulated by the profit and loss system that we get in other words, we don't get too much of, of something and too little of another. We get production that conforms as closely as possible to consumer preferences, and we get that through a voluntary system. It's, it's, it's realizations like this that I think turn people into libertarians. Uh, forget Austrian economics in particular, just libertarians. When you understand this process, it's so extraordinary and impressive and amazing, and we never learned about it in school, and yet it's cooler than anything we ever learned in school. It suddenly makes you rethink everything, at least in, at least for me. Just to think that society, in fact, oh, how about that? Society 
seems to run according to certain principles, and maybe it ought to be left alone to do that. All right, now here's a terrible segue. Uh, here I've been talking about profit and how wonderful it is. Now I want to talk about taxes, which are terrible. But if, if you have to pay them, you can at least try to pay as little as possible. And here I want to do what uh, I have pledged to do, which is to make mention of websites that people who listen to this show create. As long as they use my uh, special link, uh, check out tomwoods.com slash publicity, and you'll see uh, what that's all about. But one such person who used my link to get uh, hosting started uh, ajfreedomfinancial.com. And at ajfreedomfinancial.com, well, you'll see what it's all about when you get there. What I want to tell you about is they will help you pay as little in taxes as you can possibly pay. And in fact, the creator of the site says, please mention that if someone signs up for one of my monthly plans starting as low as $10 a month, I will build that person a comprehensive tax plan, potentially saving them thousands of dollars in taxes. If they don't like my plan, they can always cancel their membership. And also members of the Supporting Listeners program at supportinglisteners.com, if you contact Josh Fallenstein, who um, is with AJ Freedom Financial, if you like him on Facebook, on private Facebook group, and you're a supporting listener, then uh, he'll create a tax plan for you for free. So what Josh ultimately says is that it, it's his goal to try to ease the tax burden on people as much as possible because he has certain moral beliefs about taxation, and so he takes that very seriously. So it's, it's very much worth checking out ajfreedomfinancial.com. I will insert that as the listener website mentioned at tomwoods.com slash 697. Now, next week, I'm going to be in Auburn, Alabama for the best week of the year, my favorite week of the year. It is the Mises Institute's Mises University Summer Program. And I went to it in 1993 as an undergraduate. I met Murray Rothbard there, and it really changed my life completely. So it, to me, to be on the other side of things and actually doing some of the teaching at that event is a thrill I can hardly contain myself about. Now, the Mises Institute is making available access to this event for people who can't be there in person. They're calling it Virtual Mises University, and you can watch all the lectures, you can get and download all the slides that are used by the presenters get access to all the readings. This is all with the exception of Judge Napolitano's lectures. The, there, there's no recording allowed. It's a very elite setup. You won't get that, but you'll get absolutely everything else. And it's for 20 smackers, and I think 20 smackers is an incredible deal for that. But you, let's see, what days is it? Probably you're hearing this on, if you listen on the day of release, July 2016. If you join supportinglisteners.com, uh, let's say between, it, it's got to be, got to be a newcomer. I'm sorry, not my existing people. You're wonderful people, but you don't qualify for this. Let's say between July 20th and July 25th, if you join supportinglisteners.com, I will pay that for you. And you can just get Mises University virtually for free. I'll pay that for you. You got to sign up and then write to me at, on my contact page at tomwoods.com. And I'll do that for you because I love this program and I know you're going to love it too. All right. I got Murray Sabrin coming on tomorrow and we're going to talk about the Republican convention. I haven't been able to watch it. I haven't got any cable set up here. I got no moved into a house. But no doubt Murray is following it closely and I'll certainly have a lot of things to say. So Murray Sabrin on the Republican convention coming up on the next episode. So thanks everybody so much for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Into the fray.
agree. I totally agree. Totally. It's great to be here in New York. Um, yeah. Let's relax. I was just in Atlantic City, and I don't know if you're familiar with Atlantic City, but if you hate yourself and your family and your friends, take them to Atlantic City. It's basically like if Las Vegas had diarrhea, but then when you went to wipe it, you didn't use toilet paper. You just found like old cups and torn up shoes and other things you find in a dumpster. And then you were to throw it down and then it grew lights. That would be Atlantic City. Every guy's like, hey, you know, Tony, he said you might want to go over to the thing. And, you know, and you're like, first of all, why don't you put on a shirt, all right? Like, <laughs> let's start there. And then every girl either has blonde hair with black streaks or black hair with blonde streaks. <laughs> Which either way says, I don't have a gag reflex. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. But you know what Atlantic City does have a lot of? Casinos. Yeah. Oh, boy, what a treat that is. <laughs> I love casinos because casinos are one of the last venues where you can see the extremes of society in one place. Where else can you get that? Rehab? <laughs> the zoo? <laughs> casinos. Go to a casino. You can see a man on the casino floor. He's in a suit. He's drinking scotch. He's putting a few thousand dollars down on a hand. And you're like, yeah, dude, I can see why you're here. You know how to live. And then right next to him, you see another guy. And he's wearing jean shorts and a sleeveless shirt. And he's got four open wounds on his face. And you're like, yeah, I can see why you're here, too. You seem lucky. <laughs> on my flight, on the way out here, I'm flying, and the pilot comes over to the PA, and he goes, uh... Hey, or, well, he doesn't say hey. <laughs> Pilots don't usually start their announcement with hey. <laughs> hey, I'm up front. What do you think of that? <laughs> he just, he starts. I don't know how they start. He just starts. He's like, I'm the pilot. <laughs> and we're all like, I totally believe you. Yeah. <laughs> and then he goes, uh, we made up some time in the air, so we're going to be early. But then I just talked to the airport, and it's congested, so we're going to be in a holding pattern, and now we're going to be late. And everybody's like, why the hell did you tell us that, man? Like, keep that to yourself, you know? 
But then you accept it, right? I mean, I did. The guy sitting next to me, he did not accept it. He turns to me and he goes, just land the plane. And I go, where? Like, the place that takes planes is full. <laughs> Do you want to land in a field right now? And he gets, like, more aggressive. He's like, you just land the plane! And I was like, dude, you can't. You can't just be like, well, we're coming. So... Move. Here we come. But that's what's so great about being a pilot. Their knowledge is so specific, you can't question them, you know? Like, that pilot, I'm sure, was telling the truth. I'm sure that the airport was probably full. But he could have been trying to get a job from a flight attendant been like, hey, why don't you suck it? And then she's like, well, we gotta land the plane. He's like, I'll just tell them the airport's full. They're total idiots. <laughs> and that's why I wanna be a pilot now. <laughs> One of the things I love about being in a big city is that you get to experience the full spectrum of gay. You know what I mean? Like, most places, you go to the Midwest or something, you're like, hey, do you have any gay people here? And they'll be like, you mean that guy that wears pink and likes fruit? And you're like, no. There's way more than that. Like, just today, I saw business gay, artsy gay, dungeon gay, and my all-time favorite, Jim Rat Gay. You've seen him. He's a bizarre hybrid of skinny and muscular. He has the legs of a flamingo and the chest of a lumberjack. It's like he's grown muscles to fight his gayness. And at the half, the score is tied. I like ballroom dancing, and I can bench 365. Whoa! Which side's gonna win? I'll tell you. Gay. Gay's gonna win. Speaking of gay, I did something gay the other day. Now, when I say gay, I don't mean like lame. Like when people go, that movie was gay. And you're like, why? And they're like, because there were only three explosions. <laughs> that was gay. That's not what I mean. I mean like, that movie was gay. Why? Because there were all these naked guys, and they kept having sex with other naked guys. <laughs> that kind of gay. So I go to the grocery store, and I put all my items on the belt, and then I take the divider thing to, like, keep your stuff away from my stuff, right? <laughs> and... Yeah, I don't want our stuff touching, so, like... <laughs> I'm waiting a while, so I'm frustrated, right? So when it's my turn, I turn to the guy behind me, and I'm like, what's up, bitch? I'm next. Like, I don't say it, but he knows what time it is, right? So... <laughs> right before I turn away from him, I notice out of the corner of my eye that this guy has this really, I mean, tremendously impressive bulge in his pants, right? Now, 
Let's get something out of the way. There are a lot of fake bulges out there, okay? A lot of European guys, especially Italian guys, they will wear, like, really tight underwear and then really tight jeans, but that's like putting your d*** in a headlock. That's not like a real bulge, okay? The guy I was standing next to, he had a bulge over here. Like that. Yeah. So, naturally, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like, this thing looked like it had its own feeding schedule <laughs> and health care plan, okay? So, anyways. I'm staring lovingly at his gift, all right? And then I start to hear, 3362. 3362. Sir, your total is 3362. And I'm like, oh no. I'm supposed to pay right now, but everybody sees me staring at this guy's. So I have to come up with a game plan of how to get out of it. You know, how to make it look like I'm not doing exactly what I'm doing. So I decide, I'll just make it look like I'm lost in thought. You know? Because you can look anywhere and be thinking like, <laughs> So that's my plan. So I just turn from him, I just quickly turn to the cashier and I go, oh, I'm sorry. I just can't remember if I was supposed to get orange juice. And then she goes, well, why don't you ask his <laughs> Watching television and I saw the show called How Winning the Lottery Changes Your Life. Yeah. Which just the existence of that show means there are enough people that go, I don't know what happens when you win the lottery. If you could please create a moving picture show so I could wrap my head around it. I'll tune in every week. Really? I've never won the lottery. I have a pretty good idea what happens. You have a lot more now. End of show. Everybody on the show is boring, okay? Except for the guy that won the biggest lottery ever. $350 million. Mm-hmm. And he takes pride in the fact that he's never changed. Like he still goes to work every day, he still drives the same car, and he still doesn't have any teeth. What? Yeah. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I had $350 million, I'd be buying other people teeth, all right? I'd just walk down the streets and be like, hey, smile, want some teeth? It's on me. Speaking as a guy with a full set of chompers, I can tell you that having teeth is totally awesome. And if you only have $15, you should use that money as a down payment for teeth. Not only will you get to enjoy all the cuisines of the world, but you also won't look like, well, like you don't have any teeth. Get some teeth. Can we park at teeth for a second? Seriously? 
I'm meeting people all the time now that don't have any teeth. What is going on in your head where you think it's okay to walk around all mushy mouth? You know, just. Dude, get it together. That is not okay. I can only imagine what your balls look like if the part everybody sees you don't care about. Here's what you need to do if you don't have teeth, okay? Get some friends. Get some friends, have them lend you money. If any of my friends were like, hey, Tom, can I borrow $50? I'd be like, well, what do you need $50 for? Well, I don't know if you noticed, but when I talk, I don't have any teeth in my mouth. I'd be like, you know what? I did notice that. Here's $100. You don't have to pay me back. Luckily for me, there was another show on after that lottery show. This one was called, I Didn't Know I Was Pregnant. Yeah. I saw that show and I was like, I didn't know your vagina was Yankee Stadium. Exactly how many people need to be in there before you realize somebody's in there? You know? Like... The show, if you haven't seen it, it's not like, oh, I missed my period. Turns out I'm six weeks pregnant. That's not the show. The show is, oh, I missed my period. Hey, what's that? That's a baby coming out of me. <laughs> now, here's something you should know about the show. Every woman on the show is Mexican, okay? <laughs> They're all Mexican. So you know this isn't the first time that they've been pregnant. Seriously? We're gonna play that game right now? Mexicans don't have babies? I guess black guys raise their kids and Puerto Ricans won't stab you in broad daylight. Okay. are we playing right now? The, the real world isn't real game? You want to play that game? Well, here's my question for all the señoritas <laughs> that don't know there's a baby inside of you. Did you forget all the symptoms? You put on 60 pounds. You think that's from all the churros that you've been eating? You have a bubble belly, swollen feet. What about the kicking, right, ladies? The kicking, wouldn't that give it a... Hey, put your arm right here. What's that feel like to you? Uh, it feels like you have a baby inside of you. No, I just got a fart. I got a fart real bad. And then they get to the question that you're dying to ask, which is, well, when did you know you were pregnant? And they all answer the same way. When, one day, I was walking around, and I was like, whoa, I gotta take a <laughs> 
But then, when I went to it wasn't a it was a baby. So you're like, okay, Hemingway, I see what you're saying. But it does beg the question, if what you thought was gonna be a turns out to be a baby, what kinds of are you normally taking? Like, I'm a big dude. I've taken some mean dumps in my life. I've never had a seven pound, five pound If I did, I would reevaluate everything in my life. Physically, psychologically, spiritually, I'm making changes, and so should you, Marisol. I think in life, you can only really comment on things you've experienced. You know what I mean? Like, if I tell you, you gotta go eat at this restaurant, it's great. And then you go there and you're like, it was horrible. I can't really argue with you, because you had your own experience. That's why I feel totally comfortable telling you that I don't like midgets. <laughs> at all. I don't like them. Because they're always in a bad mood. I don't know if it's the drinking or just being down there, but they're always in a bad, they're always with the <laughs> Which I find kind of bizarre because they walk like there's a really happy song playing in their head. You know? So, usually, when I see a midget, I'm like, huh, maybe he'll juggle. He won't. <laughs> He's not going to do anything cool at all. I was doing this show, and I did some midget jokes, and everybody likes midget jokes, right? right? No, wrong. Midgets don't like midget jokes. But I didn't know there was...